Hey guys, I am back, and hey, guess what I have in front of me? I have the iPhone 10 or iPhone X, as a lot of people are calling it, in the space gray and 256 variety. Yes, I caved in, but really, really evaluating uh, whether I want to keep it. So things are still up in the air, which is what I really want to clear in this review. And the other thing that came in the mail is this. This is from Calypso Crystal. This is the Calypso case in the Cabrio style. I have the Optimistic Journey color, which you'll find out really soon. So um, I thought I'd do something a little different. Everyone's doing an unboxing video. I did one before with the iPhone 8. Um, but I think what people really want to know about is, you know, for the iPhone 10. How different is it? Is it from the iPhone 8, right? I have actually both phones in front of me, and I thought, okay, I can do a comparison. Sure, other people have done comparisons, but let's take a traveler's perspective because you guys are all travelers and fans of travel. Um, I've been thinking about different ways to test it and show you um, in the real world how do they really compare? Is it worth the difference in price point? And then, of course, this lovely case as well, uh, comparing it with the Apple leather case. Um, so anyways, why don't we get started? Um, if you haven't yet, make sure you subscribe to the Going Awesome Places channel, give a like as well. Why don't we get started? I think the first thing we wanna do is open up this bad boy. Um, I've kind of taken a sneak peek and I've set things up just to get things started, but uh, I gotta say, I was really, really impressed when I first opened this box. Box is all the same, similar to the iPhone 8. I got this actually right here. This is the iPhone 8. It's slightly bigger, and that kind of makes sense because the iPhone 10 is larger in size. Beautiful box, and it's nicely embossed with a bit of a, a space gray glow on it, which is kind of cool. And then when you open it, the usual, you got this instruction booklet, nothing new, with stickers inside, very key. Uh, but what is most important is then the phone, which you'll find inside here. So you pull it out, and I've just been setting it up and restoring it from my iPhone 8 phone. So I got that there. The rest is honestly the same. You got your block here, your standard ear pods um, with the adapter as well. So sadly, as you guys already know already, that uh, the auxiliary jack is not present on this phone. You do need this adapter, which has been actually very, very annoying. For somebody that does um, audio recording with a lav that does require an aux, uh, both the iPhone 8 and the 10, extremely annoying because I found that uh, with the Rode application, with a mic actually, it does um, capture a bit of noise when you uh, wiggle it. Um, there seems to be some loose connection, I'm not too sure. And as well, sometimes it'll actually um, cause the app to almost glitch out. So during a recording, it'll stop recording out of nowhere because you may have shifted things around with the adapter. So haven't been a fan of this overall, kind of sucks, I hope they bring it back. Uh, you got your lightning charger as well, so all that's in there. But what I really want to do for you guys is uh, the all-important taking off the plastic wrap. You guys saw in my last video, I really struggled with it. This time, screw it, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it in front of you guys, okay? So plastic wrap is still on and it is coming off. Oh my gosh. Oh! screen protector. I don't know how I'm gonna do this, but here it is. Woo. Wow. Okay, let me put this down. And I think I'll just start off with first impressions. Um, it, it's, I will say, I didn't think I'd be that impressed, but looking at the two phones, um, it is, hold on, let's take it to the home screen. Uh, it is pretty darn impressive. Like, I've been so used to this form factor for years now that you kind of get used to the top and bottom um, bezel, I guess you can call it the top and bottom black part. Uh, but when you look at this and it's not even there, you don't even understand what's going on. It, it is the full screen. Um, and I'm just trying to compare here. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy. So. The screen is absolutely beautiful. That is probably the biggest selling point for this phone. 
and yeah, I, it's a better screen overall. I mean, I have the brightness set up to about the same level and the iPhone 10 is just brighter. And something about the colors, it looks sharper and is, looks a little bit sharper, a little warmer actually, even though both have true tone and it's just freaking gorgeous. So I think that's really the first reaction I think most of you guys are gonna have, which is just, damn, this is amazing. Um, embrace the notch or not, I still gotta get, to see if I can get used to that, uh, but damn, that's crazy. Um, on the back, I would say the, the space gray backing on this is darker than this, just by looking at it, yep, it's definitely darker. <clears throat> it's got the two cameras on the back. Um, the logo on the back here with the reflective Apple logo is larger for sure. And the rest is pretty much the same. It's maybe it's just more reflective. I feel like this is darker than this one, the iPhone 10, because the reflective backing of the iPhone 10 is just a little bit more reflective. Um, that or the backing is lighter, which is causing it to look more reflective. Um, but yeah, I'd say there's there's definitely a bit of a difference there. But yeah, those are kind of first um, first impressions there. Um, I think the other thing obviously is no home button. We all knew that coming into it. And yeah, I'm, I'm wondering myself just how I'm gonna get used to this. With all the videos I've watched so far, it seems pretty intuitive, but it's gonna require some taking used to just because you know we've been using a home button for forever. Um, the execution of the kind of the new home button that's not a physical home button um, was done flawlessly. So I'm curious to see how this is. So anyways, I've done kind of my unboxing now and really want to get to the meat of this video, which is just how do these compare? Um, there's a bunch of things I want to test. I want to take this out on the road for a bit and uh, really put them to a test. Let's put the cases on and I guess we will do some testing. Okay, so I got the, I got the Apple, I got the Apple leather case here in the saddle brown. Fits like a glove. And then over here I got the Calypso case Cabrio in the optimistic journey. Oh, beautiful leather smell. Like this is definitely a higher quality leather than, um, than what Apple has here. It feels solid all around. So, man, that curved bezel on this glass looks incredible. Um, they've done a really good job with this. It's not fully edge to edge, but it's pretty close. Um, nice curvature. And I will say that the black chrome across the sides is a bit of a throwback um, and just looks gorgeous because if you, sorry, I gotta take this one off. Um, if you look at the iPhone 8, it's, um, it's more of a matte finish to the side, so it's the space gray. Um, here it's not so much of that matte space gray, but it is a dark chrome, which is something I always loved, especially when I was into car modding. Dark chrome was a thing and they brought it back here. Uh, larger side button, um, damn, looks really nice. Okay, anyways, got distracted. Putting the case on, pretty easy. Just kind of pop it in, but there it is. <clears throat> Got the case on. So we got the optimistic, optimistic journey here and Saddle Brown. These are the two cases, iPhone 8 on this hand, iPhone 10 on the other hand. It's time to test these guys out. Well, I am back. It's been really interesting for the past couple days, really stress testing most of these phones on the field, and I've been able to make a lot of interesting observations. Um, but lots to talk about. I think let's break it down a little bit. The first part that I wanna get into is really around, okay, 
the functional specs of the phones, what's different between the two, and things that you're really gonna notice. And then let's get on to the practical stuff. So the everyday usage as a traveler, um, using things like social media, travel apps, uh, just browsing around, what are the differences that you're gonna see? And really then my final conclusions of whether the iPhone 10 is worth it over the eight. Um, some things to think about, really a lot of food for thought for those that are trying to make a decision in terms of which ones to get. Okay, so why don't we get started with the facts. Um, there are a lot of changes with the iPhone 10. The iPhone 10 has made a lot of improvements, a lot of changes from the iPhone 8 that I, uh, that I got about a couple months ago. So when you compare the two, what are the biggest changes? So the first part, I would say, and something that I was really excited in, in terms of testing was really Face ID. So Face ID is something that's brand new, obviously big change in terms of no home button, okay, big deal. Um, you can't use your fingerprint to essentially unlock your phone. So now you're using your face, it projects a bunch of dots onto your face and then you know figures out that it's you and unlocks the phone. So I was curious when I first got the phone how to set it up and it's actually very, very easy. So for me, after I restored my phone, it essentially asked me to set up Face ID and I'm, I'm gonna show you what it looks like. So here's what Face ID looks like and it tells you to get started. And really, it's like your head is a compass. If you've ever had to recalibrate your compass, it's the same kind of thing except you're using your head. So you're kind of moving it around. Oh, gotta get all the green bars. First scan complete. And second scan. So we're gonna do it again. And honestly, I'll say that this is as easy, if not easier than the fingerprint setup. Because if you remember, the fingerprint setup was kind of annoying. You had to constantly lift, uh, press down, lift, and kind of change your angles. You're kind of moving it around. You have to do it a couple times, I think twice, and then it's finally done. Sometimes it doesn't get it right, or sometimes you press it, it's not good enough, and it keeps telling you to do it over and over and over. Uh, very frustrating, especially when I help my grandpa do it. Um, so, Face ID, piece of cake, works uh, in terms of setup really, really well. Um, I'll talk about the more practicality stuff maybe a little bit afterwards. The second part that I wanted to show you guys uh, that I think is a, is a really big change is really the camera. So, um, obviously, big difference, you're starting with one camera to two cameras or two lenses and you know, on the front of things, it doesn't look like much has changed. 12 megapixel, 12 megapixel. Front camera, seven megapixel, seven megapixel. So same number of megapixels, um, but you definitely notice the difference. Now, this is an F1.8 single lens uh, camera. Now this is two, it's an F1.8 wide angle, an F2.4, I believe, zoom lens. So that's pretty awesome. Now that's no different than really the pluses that have been around. Um, so you can choose from one focal length or you can tap to get zoom lens, which is really nice. So you can get nice and close without having to use your digital zoom, uh, which degrades the quality. Uh, now the other part of it is the new or not so new portrait mode, but they've added a whole bunch of new uh, modes within the portrait feature. So, uh, before you had the natural light, this is what allows you to create really great portrait photos or if you want to really isolate on a subject, that bouquet kind of look that you get from DSLRs. Um, now they have a bunch of other features like studio light, contour light, uh, stage light, and stage light mono. All these are kind of neat little features uh, that I call more of a novelty than anything. Um, I'll get to why. Now, the front-facing camera is the 7 megapixel camera and I actually tested it on the field last night and I was taking selfies and you notice side by side, it didn't really look all that different. I was like, man, they're both kind of grainy. I thought the camera was better, um, you know, what's the deal? So I, I looked up the specs again, 7 megapixels. Uh, really, the only difference is that it's true tone or true depth, sorry, true depth. Um, and what that means is that, uh, you know, with the what allows portrait mode to happen is really the, the two lenses back here. Uh, that's what allows to project that depth into to kind of the 
computer to essentially calculate um, how to create those images. Um, with the camera and the technology here for Face ID, I think they leverage both of them to allow you to have those same portrait features on the selfie camera. So I actually took a bunch of creepy photos um, in selfie mode and um, they both work really well, but for some reason I look really creepy in them, especially the stage light model. So I'll do another one here. And it does an isolation and does, you know, the black background thing. It's quite terrifying. So um, I've taken a bunch of them, as you can see, uh, quite the collection. And uh, yeah, they're interesting. I don't know how useful they'd be. I would say after testing a few of them, that natural light, the original uh, function of portrait is still probably the most useful out of all of them. I, I can see doing some really cool um, photography, whether they're portraits or just of certain objects or macro type photography uh, would be kind of cool. So. Um, that's a difference. Um, last thing I'd say is video. Um, I had the opportunity to basically do one of these and I was just testing it at home, nothing fancy. I was taking some footage and I'll say that the biggest difference I've noticed with video is that um, this is a lot better, the iPhone 10, even though um, the specs are very close to each other, um, this lens is a lot better, but for some reason just, I didn't expect this massive difference, but when I'm shooting at 1080 at 60 frames per second and I have them side by side, this is much smoother, smoother. and the processor for both are actually the same. It's the same processor, um, but when you have them side by side like this, and I was doing a recording top down like that, you'll notice that uh, the iPhone 10 a lot less choppy, the iPhone 8 a little bit choppy. You see uh, a few more uh, artifacts uh, in the lighting and uh, it isn't able to keep up as fast. So I would say that for video, this is a lot better, which is surprising because I thought video on this was already really, really good when I didn't have this one. Um, if we're talking about quality, I'd say quality of both are excellent. And in terms of photography, uh, I just went uh, traveling with the iPhone 8 for the past month, and I'd say that coming from you know the iPhone 6, uh, which was the most the newest phone I've ever worked with, um, that the camera was the the contrast was amazing, the dynamic range, very contrasty type photos, maybe a bit too touched up than what I naturally like out of a. Uh, SLR, more of a raw type of feel that allows me to, to have more bandwidth to do editing. Um, but I mean, out of, straight out of the camera on the iPhone 8, really, really good. Um, this is going to be even better. Now, is it going to be light years away from what you have on the 8? I wouldn't say so. It's marginally better. I do like I do like the fact that I can zoom in, so I'm not you know um, ruining the photos by digitally zooming, pinch to zoom. Um, but it's not that much better. It is better. I, I do see more detail for sure, um, but yeah, it's. It, I think it handles the light slightly better as well, but it's not gonna be that much better. It is probably one of the best cameras on a phone today uh, for now, but uh, yeah, it's, it's not something that truly blew me away. Uh, I tested in some low light conditions. They were pretty close, um, unless you start pixel peeping. And I would say probably the most fun part of the iPhone 10 is it's really easy, sending an emojis. Uh, you just go down here, pick an animal. My favorite's been this guy here. Okay, so really easy, honestly. Uh, it's really been jokes uh, sending these to people. And the great thing is that the recipient doesn't have to have an iPhone 10. It really just records it as a video and you send it off and they can watch it and laugh at you. But uh, this is what I've been doing. Ooh, look at it jiggle, look at it jiggle. I, I love poo. You get, to, you get to watch it, of course, watch all the hilarity and then you send it over. Looks like you can, oh, you can throw it up too. You can send some poo. Just tap, hold. Tap and hold. And I guess you're sending a lot of poo. 
And if you want to save it, you just do that. And then you save the video so you can keep your own copy of the hilarity. And so I've been doing a lot of that. Um, I'm sure this is gonna wear off over time, but for now, it's pretty amusing. Okay, so last thing is, last big, big, big thing is, that I can talk about is really, um, it's really the screen. And uh, you guys saw it when I first unboxed the phone and when I, my first reaction to it is just, oh my gosh, like those black bars have gone to the top and the bottom. Like this is a whole new world, right? And I think after really, really testing around it and in the practical usage part of the video, you'll really see it. Um, the real estate is great, but I feel like all they've done is really stretched it top to bottom. So it's a much longer phone. It's not that much wider. So you don't actually get, you, you get something that's bigger. It feels like you're much more free now because the whole screen is now um, available to you. But in terms of actual usage, in terms of um, practical practicality, I guess, of iOS, you're not getting much else because you're not getting a new row of apps. Um, they've really just stretched things long, up and down, and most apps that have adapted to it have really kind of done the same. They've maybe moved some things to the top and the bottom to free up some space, but in terms of the actual use, usable part of the app, all the same. Um, but it is really, really, really impressive. Now the notch hasn't really annoyed me too much. I will say that it is slightly annoying that I can't see the battery percentages at the top. Um, and then there's the rest of things, right? Um, being so used to having a, a home button and not having it takes a while to get used to, but I feel like with time that it won't be too bad. Um, I have gotten usage, I have been getting used to kind of the, the finger swipes to get to where I need to. Um, so the main things are, would be how to go home. So if you're, you're, you're browsing along and you wanna go back home, you don't have a home button, all you have to do is go from the bottom and you flick up. That was really easy to, to pick up. So that wasn't hard to do. If you go from here and you swipe down from the top right down, that's how you get your notification center, or sorry, your, your control center, um, which is a little different from this guy, which is, which is a pull up. So instead of a pull up, you're swiping down from the top left. And that's how you get your battery percentage. That's the only place you can see it um, without working too hard. Um, otherwise, it's not really there. Um, the other part is your notifications. So swiping from top left down, or really the top from the notch downwards, you get this. Um, with here, it used to be just top down from anywhere and you get it and that's great. What's different about um, this, I'd say, is that you'll notice that you have, a, you have your flashlight and your camera here. At first, this was really frustrating to use because I kept tapping it, not really activating. I didn't know why. And it's because it uses force uh, or, or 3D touch or, or I guess 3D touch. So you can only activate it by pushing down, feeling that small vibration and letting go. That's how it turns on. Really gotta like really push in. It's not just a tap. Tap's not gonna activate. I guess they're worried that in your pocket it might accidentally activate. Um, same thing with camera. You really gotta push to activate the camera, and then I guess you swipe up to close out. Um, you can still access your camera by swiping, so that's the same as before. So that's kind of nice. Uh, the other part and something that I've really learned to enjoy is the app switcher. So if you have a bunch of apps open, so let's say I have the App Store open, I have my sports app open, and all you gotta do now, which is really nice, is because you have this white bar at the bottom, it really reminds you that there's something to do there. Uh, you can swipe up to go back home, but you can also just swipe left to right to get to apps. That's nice because over here with the, with the old iPhone 8 is that you always had to do your double tap. So with the old iPhone 8, you always had to do a double tap. So a double tap opened your traditional app switcher and you had to go from here to go to different apps or you just had to remember and, and 
at home, you know, figure out your, your other apps to go to. But double tap to get to your app switcher and then you switch to another app. Now this is always kind of annoying because what if you wanted to, um, you wanted to see something from another screen so that maybe you're using a calculator and you want to punch some numbers in. Now you can quickly go left and right. So left, pick up some of your numbers, go to the calculator, punch it in, and then you're good to go. Or if you just want to quickly switch without having to double tap, uh, I feel like that's going to be a lot more convenient. I feel like it's something that this, fee uh, this phone can definitely build in. Uh, they haven't yet, uh, but I, I like it. More of a pleasant surprise feature of the iPhone 10 in this new iOS. The last thing is the more traditional app switcher. So uh, it still exists today. What you have to do though is basically, I'll do that again. So from the bottom, you swipe up, hold, and then it switches over. It vibrates a little bit so you feel that. And so I'm gonna do it one more time. Yeah, you hold up, and that's how you get your app switcher. So this looks pretty much the same as before. The apps look a lot longer, kind of suit uh, that fits the screen that you now have, and you can switch to different apps. Now, one thing that really bugged me about this app switcher is that you can't, you can't um, close your apps that easily anymore. I don't really know why. I haven't figured it out yet. But when you swipe up, it actually just takes you home, and I think that's because the swiping up um, motion is very similar to the going home function so you can confuse the two so if you if you swipe from the bottom or if you swipe from the middle there it could cause some confusion so what they've done is they eliminated that you can't actually close up apps by swiping up anymore so how you do it is actually you have to hold and wait for the uh, minus button to show up so that's how you close up apps you can click on the minus button to sh shut down the apps, or like before, use your fingers and swipe up. None of that's really changed. Close up all the apps. Um, so that's been kind of interesting. So now what I'd like to do is turn your attention to have these phones side by side. So I think that's really the true comparison between these two phones to really help you make that decision. I'm gonna walk through a few scenarios that I have wanted to test or have tested already to really give you a better picture of um, you know, which phone is better or worse and some of my two cents of what I felt over these past couple days. All right, so now we're ready to do a serious side-by-side -side comparison of the two phones. We have the iPhone 8 on the left-hand side. We have the iPhone 10 on the right side. Um, so immediately when you look at them, like I said, it's a screen that really pops out for you. Um, you have the notch at the top, but beyond that, it's pretty much, it takes up the entire device of the iPhone 10 versus if you look at the iPhone 8, you're used to the top and bottom black bars, but you don't realize what you're missing until you see the iPhone 10 when it takes up everything. Um, so first thing uh, that you're probably wondering is what are my thoughts on the taking away of the home button? And to be honest, I do miss it. Um, Face ID, uh, even though it works pretty well, um, I do miss one very important thing and one important feature of the iPhone 8. So if we lock both phones, um, with the iPhone 8, what you were able to do before was pretty much just put your finger to the home button, press down, it reads your fingerprint, and then you're good to go. You're in the phone, you're ready to be productive. Now, with the iPhone 10, it's a little bit different. You wake it up by using the side home button. You activate it. It's gonna have to look for your face. Hold on. Okay. And after it's unlocked, you notice that the lock uh, button is, or, or sorry, the lock icon is now unlocked. Yeah, so it's unlocked. You then have to swipe up to get back to home screen. So that's actually kind of annoying. Um, it's a two-step process versus the one-step process that it was before. And I feel like they've had to do that for a couple of things in terms of compromise just to kind of make things work. So unfortunately, that was something that I didn't really like a whole lot. Now, what I'll say about Face ID is that it works pretty well anywhere. Um, I've tried it in the dark. I've tried it in low lighting conditions, great lighting conditions. All those things haven't really been an issue. Um, 
you just have to, sometimes it's kind of weird in terms of when it's looking for your face. Um, Cause let's say, let's say it fails and you're, you're just trying to like, okay, is it, is it checking my face? Is it not? Um, you kind of need to like shut it down or, or actually just close it up, turn it back on and then, okay, get it to read again. Um, and it's good. So uh, it's pretty good. Um, it's pretty impressive, I will say. Uh, but I don't know if it's that much more game changing than the fingerprint sensor, but all in the name of, I guess, having a bigger screen, correct? Um, so what else is there to talk about now? I think in playing around with all the different apps that I have and all the daily things that you're going to be using it for, whether it's just for going to work or you're traveling, um, I think at the end of the day, what they've had to do with building of these apps is essentially leverage some of that real estate at the top and the bottom. But at the end of the day, the space that you have to work with for the app, the productive space of the app doesn't really change a whole lot. Now, the screen is a little bit wider, only marginally. It is a lot taller, but because it isn't that much wider, um, you don't get actually that much more space. So let me show you what I mean. So for example, let's say you go into Twitter and um, you're going home right here. And, and this is a perfect example of what I mean. So if I line kind of the lines up right now in terms of where the main content is, um, you're getting, Twitter's actually pretty good. You do get to see much more content. So almost this entire bar of content is new. Um, what most apps have done is basically any sort of um, menu system type functionality, they've been able to leverage that bottom space to really open up the content area. Um, the top is more or less the same. And so you have vertically a lot of space. You do see a lot more, which is awesome. Um, so that is good. Uh, where you notice where it doesn't give you actually that much more is what I was interested in was video. And, and so a lot of you guys are going to be going to YouTube and I actually have these side by side. It's one of my coffee videos if you haven't watched yet in New York City. Uh, but if I again line up the lines, uh, especially for YouTube, I've noticed this um, because we're not using a 16 by 9 kind of like a film format. Um, you really only have that much more uh, real estate for video. Now it's cool that it's able to use the whole screen for the suggested videos here uh, versus here, um, but you're actually not getting a much bigger screen per se in terms of watching video. Um, and I'll do another example with Netflix. It really doesn't help when I'm watching Voyager. So um, I've been catching up on Voyager. You guys should definitely do it if you haven't done yet. Um, but if you're watching Voyager, you really don't notice it. So I'm just gonna let this play a little bit. Okay, so I have Voyager up and running and I have it side by side. And I don't know, it's not actually that much bigger. Like it, it might be a bit hard to see, but the lines almost line up. I might get a few hairlines of extra space. So this is the old format, uh, old TV format. But uh, if you look at new widescreen video, let's say Logan here, it's a little bit better because you do have the full widescreen. All right, so you'll notice that you can go full wide by double tapping on Netflix and that actually goes all the way end to end. The notch definitely takes away some of the video, but it's pretty close. You got really thin bars on the top and the bottom. And with this, you can zoom in a Actually, you're not able to zoom in at all, um, but you're, you still got your black bar. So for wide format videos, uh, it does look really stunning on the iPhone 10. Uh, that's where it really shines. But for other types of videos like YouTube and old TV format videos, not so much. Okay, so a few other examples like, you know, uh, the App Store. How does it look different? And again, not that much different. Um, you do get, again, that extra bar of content. So again, it's great for seeing more, especially when vertically scrolling, but not that much more. I'll go into Gmail, and only a lot of you guys use Gmail. So again, I'll line it up, and you really don't notice too much of it at all, even less than some of the other apps. Um, you really only get that small bar uh, of extra space down below. I'm gonna go to Google Maps. 
also the same amount of space that you get extra on the bottom uh, with Gmail. It's about the same for Google Maps. So you get some extra space, but how much more useful is it? I'm not too sure and I'm not too convinced that that's going to really change um, how I'm going to be interacting with the phone. I think what's interesting is that, you know, um, most of these apps, app creators or uh, app designers have actually had to make a decision because they still have to support the old apps uh, or the old uh, viewport of apps for all the older iPhones, so iPhone 8 and under, but they've also had to create kind of a secondary version for the newer iPhone, the iPhone 10, where they've been smart enough to move things around, like let's go to Instagram, for example, and let's go into stories. Uh, what they've done for anything that is menu related or something like in stories, being able to change between live, normal, boomerang, and super zoom, and all those different types of fun features, you, they can now leverage this bottom space for it. But that's nice and all. But in terms of usable space, it's still about the same. Do you know what I mean? So like this stuff is all, they all kind of still need to be there. Yes, I can move this to the bottom there, but you know, is it um, this part here in terms of your active screen, is it that much different? And that's really because like when you're designing the apps, the, they have a specific viewport in mind. Um, this part of the screen isn't that much bigger. It's a little bit taller, uh, slightly wider, not by much though, not by much. So again, this is, this is Instagram side by side and kind of cool that for a photo like this, I can see a bit more. So again, the, you do have much more space here. The menu is moved to the bottom, which opens things up, especially for vertically scrolled uh, apps. But, uh, that's, that's a bit of a look of, of what apps like this look like. Um, when it comes to travel, I was, I was, I was playing around with, with some of the uh, travel apps that I have. So let's say TripAdvisor. And more or less the same. I mean, when it opens up, it's beautiful. It's all green. Um, everything takes up the entire screen. And we're in New York City right now, let's say, and we're looking for things to do. Things to do and you do get to see an additional row of content, right? So Central Park, 9-11 Memorial, uh, the Met, Top of the Rock barely fits through, but you can see most of it down here. Again, they move that bottom menu, uh, menu section all the way to the bottom here, and it opens things up for sure. Now, one thing I haven't talked about is really the um, the notch and how do I feel about the notch and it's something that you have to get used to but it's really not that bad to be honest um, how often do you really look at the notch really you're looking for things like time uh, instead of the middle it's on the top left corner um, batteries still on the top right uh, you do have to get used to cellular and Wi-Fi being on the right instead of on the left there you are going to be missing some things like the Bluetooth icon uh, and battery percentage uh, now you can get battery percentage like I said earlier by going into the control panel so it shows up 73% uh, so that is all good but kind of sad that it's missing but I kind of understand of course because you are there's just not that much space up in the notch so I'm curious to see how apps really uh, develop for the notch I think they're gonna have to really rethink the UI a bit to leverage it um, but again I'm unconvinced that people are gonna do something drastically different because they still have to design the app for most of everyone else everyone else that's using an iPhone 8 or under um, last thing I'll go into Safari and I think you're gonna notice the same type of thing again I'm gonna put them side by side just to help you guys out and uh, when browsing, it's going to be a better browsing experience because you will be able to see more vertically. I think from a width perspective, it's not that much more. Most sites are responsive, so they're going to do a pretty good job of displaying the information that you need to see. Um, here you'll notice that the where to next uh, is pretty much the last piece of the website that you get to see. The read more is more or less covered because of the bottom bar. Here the read more is fully in display, which is kind of nice. So you do get to see more vertically 
if you scroll just up a little bit or down, um, the bottom menu goes away and you get to really appreciate the extra real estate. Um, so you really have to judge, you know, is that something that's worth, worth it for you in terms of making a decision of um, buying this phone or keeping with something like an iPhone 8 or underneath. Okay, let's just go to Spotify. You're gonna be listening to jams while you're traveling or on the road. So, if we look at playlists, and again, it's the same story here. Um, I think they've they've done a pretty good job at adapting to the notch. So again, home, browse, search, radio, and your library goes all the way to the bottom now. And that opens things up for about, hold on a sec. So that opens things up to about two more songs that you can see in the list. So two more songs versus what you're able to see with the eight. So that's kind of nice. And... Yeah, so this is like if you're looking at the uh, artwork, what it looks like. Again, it, it is definitely bigger. Uh, gives you more, well, the information is more or less the same, but uh, yes, more real estate for sure. Um, you know, swiping down from the top right or top left, I've had to get used to, but it really hasn't been all that bad. The app switching is really convenient, like I talked about earlier. Just being able to do this is really nice. Uh, I can't really do that with apps here. Nope, can't do that. Um, so what about apps like Air Canada? So these are apps that I don't think they've um, fully adapted to the notch yet, which is why you're not seeing a whole lot of difference. And so um, you can tell because you can tell because they haven't really moved anything around. Um, you're only gaining this portion down below, and you saw that with the Google Apps, so Gmail and Google Maps. You only see a margin of of increase in terms of height. Uh, it's the same for the Air Canada app. So I feel like I've covered most things, but there's still a couple things I want to talk about. Now in terms of power, that's the main test that we're gonna do in a second, but um, the iPhone X is touted to have two more hours of power compared to the 8 or even the previous generation 7. The 8 has about the same amount of power capacity as the 7, so we'll really put that to the test. I will say in terms of just regular usage so far, that this definitely has more capacity, but also takes longer to charge. So I know that the iPhone X has the quick charge capability, but you do need to buy extra gear not included in the box to be able to do that. So that's a bit unfortunate. Um, the other part that I wanted to test is really the weight. Um, this is a bigger phone. Um, it's, it's a larger dimension, it's by 5.5 inch versus the 4.7 that you have here. So naturally it's gonna be a bit heavier. So I brought a nifty scale here to see in the real world how much it weighs. All right, so we got the iPhone X here and it comes in at 174.7 grams. And then over here, this is the iPhone 8, 147.9. So they're gonna be off a little bit. This does feel a little bit heftier, but honestly not by much. People talk about it being a, a heavier device, but in your hands it feels right. It doesn't feel too large for my palm anyways. Um, so I would say it's just the right size um, and, and weight really isn't too much of a factor factor in the grams. In terms of snappiness of the devices, because both use the exact same processor, uh, they both feel just as quick. Uh, you're not going to find that the iPhone 10 is faster than the iPhone 8. That's really not the case. So you're not really losing anything by going with the 8 or you're not gaining anything by going with the iPhone 10. One thing I talked about earlier is the lack of the headphone jack and it's been gone for a couple of generations now but as a traveler it kind of sucks because so if you're flying like I do you have to bring headphones that have an auxiliary jack and not Bluetooth headphones. Um, as a result 
you know, you bring your auxiliary headphones and you can use them on the plane and use them on the device there. But if you decide to use your phone to maybe watch a downloaded net Netflix movie or you're just trying to listen to music on your phone, if you forget to bring your adapter, then you're out of luck because you didn't bring your Bluetooth headset. Um, so it's one of those things that's kind of annoying. Uh, I have to carry it in a pouch, just kind of like all the other dongles and things like that. Thanks, Apple. Um, but it's something you have to consider. Now, both of them have this issue, the iPhone 8 and the 10, so it's kind of a moot point, but I wanted to bring it up anyways. I will say that the glass backing um, and the front as well um, do attract a lot of fingerprints if that's gonna bother you at all. Um, which really brings more reason for the case. I think it's a very sleek phone. It's also very, very slippery. So having a good case makes a difference. And which is why I have, well, with the iPhone 8, I have the Apple leather case as we have here. And with the iPhone 10, I have the Calypso crystal case, the monochrome edition. Um, this Cabrio case is, uh, this Cabrio case is a case that provides full protection um, and it's a lovely orange or optimistic journey color. Um, so both of these cases are ones I recommend. Um, I particularly love this one because it has this Italian, authentic Italian um, leather feel, has a smell, um, is dimpled and has that nice texture so it really helps you grip the phone and um, is perfect all around. So anyways, I got these two cases. One last test to go and that's the battery test. Okay, so for the battery test, what I want to do is make sure it's a fair fight between both phones. Because one phone has a SIM card, this phone here, the iPhone 10, and this one doesn't, I'm not going to turn on cellular services. I'm going to put both in airplane mode. I'm going to turn on Wi-Fi and Bluetooth for both. Uh, brightness, I'm going to set to medium level brightness for both. I'm going to turn on Netflix. I'm going to be watching an episode of Voyager. Uh, I'll watch it for about 10 minutes, let's say. Uh, depending on whether it makes a difference or not, 10 minutes, full episode, we'll see. And by the end of it, at the same time, we'll see how much battery is left. Okay, let's do this. It's for my father. He wants to talk. What are you gonna do? Well, I've already arranged Well, the sun has set and the lights are back on, so we've just been spending the past 40 minutes watching Star Trek Voyager, yes, uh, streamed through Netflix and saw some interesting results. So both phones actually start off at 100% and when I finished, the iPhone 8 ended off with 97%, so it dropped 3%. And this guy, the iPhone 10, also dropped down to 97%. So unfortunately, not exactly the most conclusive of results. Um, interesting that they both dropped around the same amount of battery life. I wanted a very controlled test environment and so that's kind of what I got. Um, but surprise because this supposedly has two hours or more lifetime or, or battery life uh, than the iPhone 8 but in this test it didn't reveal itself so it's hard to say and uh, I'll say that I don't know if the battery, um, the battery life is linear in that Know, if I say that 40 minutes resulted in 3% in battery dropping, uh, can you extend that all the way down to 0% of battery life? Not really sure, and perhaps uh, this does last a bit longer on the back tail of the battery. I have no idea what I'm talking about because I'm not a battery scientist, but who knows? Anyways, unfortunately that was kind of shitty, but why don't we end things off here? I know this has been a long video. Yes, I know you guys are thinking about, okay, iPhone 8, iPhone 10, which one's better, what should I do? It's a hard decision. Uh, I've been spending the past couple of days just using it, and here's my final, final conclusion about these two phones. So the iPhone 10 has a really sexy screen. There's no doubt about it. Bigger screen, better. The notch, kind of awkward, but something you get used to. Um, the screen is higher resolution. The blacks look way better. I mean, you saw the comparison when I was watching Voyager, just how different it is. It's kind of a washed out black here. I didn't even realize when I'm using it. I, I thought the eight was amazing, but using the 10, man, it's really, really good. Um, the camera on this is better. Um, just, you get your portrait mode. You don't really have that here. Camera, in terms of quality, I would say is 
better, but maybe not that much better. You know what I mean? So I get great photos out of this. I, I use this for a month on the road and love the photos I got out of this. Uh, in fact, I use a lot of these photos on Instagram. Uh, with this one, um, I, I compared the two together and this is better, but I don't know how much better. It, it's, it's pretty good, but it, it's probably the best camera phone out there. But is it uh, that much better than what's on the 8? Um, the other part is Face ID and all those kind of fun features and, and emojis. And emojis. Um, face ID works really well. Unfortunately, I feel like it's a little bit cumbersome. Um, I do like the fact that I can just log in with my thumb just like that, even as I'm pulling it out of my pocket. With Face ID, especially if you're driving, although I shouldn't be doing this, um, if it's locked, it's not really easy to unlock because you have to pull your phone from your car up into your face, unlock, put it back on the dock, or you gotta move your face over. It's probably less safe than before, I would say. Um, so I'm gonna miss that if I decide on the iPhone 10. Um, everything else, uh, I would say productivity-wise, it's all kind of the same. Uh, videos, sure, slightly larger. You get a lot of real, uh, vertical real estate, which means that is, if you're browsing websites or viewing um, uh, vertically scrolled content apps like Twitter or even like Instagram when you're traveling, um, you're gonna get more in your screen, so less scrolling. Uh, sure, that's kind of nice, but I don't know. I don't know how much of a, a deal, uh, how much more of an improvement it is over having the 8. Um, yes, this feels comfortable in my hand, so does this. Um, man, it's tough. So, at the end of the day, it's gonna be your decision. Ultimately, it's your money. Um, I think the biggest question you're gonna have to ask yourself is essentially this. I feel like all of these reviews that you're watching, even mine right now, uh, it all revolves around like, is it worth the $500 more to get this? this. They're both 256, same processor, all that good stuff. Um, are you willing to pay $500 more for, you know, the sexy screen, uh, the bigger form factor, um, better camera, um, those kind of things, face ID and all that? Or are you happy with the old form, old form factor that's about 1200 Canadian, um, gives you everything that you need to, um, does everything that you need to? or like I said, 1700 plus Canadian for this. So that is the decision you're gonna have to make, which is not an easy one, but yeah, 1700 is a lot of money for this. I could get a really nice MacBook with this, and I like my MacBook a lot more. Um, this is really good in terms of travel. Um, is, is a really useful device for sure. I do a lot of stuff on this phone. Um, the iPhone 8 is everything that I need to um, is everything the iPhone 8 is everything I need in terms of all of my uh, daily use things uh, all my apps are really useful uh, I think at the bottom uh, or I think at the end of it though what I really struggle with on top of everything I've said so far is that um, the apps aren't that much more useful with the larger screen I, I think apps are starting to adapt to it We'll see where it goes. I'm curious where iPhone 11 takes it from where this is. I think it is very intriguing. Man, it looks really good, but am I gonna keep this? I don't know, or what am I gonna do? I don't know, I guess you'll have to find out. Anyways, hope you guys enjoyed this back-to-back, side-to-side review of the iPhone 8 versus the iPhone 10. Uh, a lot more video to come. If you like this video, like it. If you haven't subscribed yet, would love to subscribe. Uh, but I'd love to keep the conversation going, so down below, leave your comments about like your struggle in deciding between the two phones. If you've made a decision, what decision did you make? Um, and if you have more questions, because I actually have these two phones in hand, uh, for now, anyways, let me know what you want to know, um, and I'll try my best to answer. And uh, yeah, let's call it a wrap, and I'll see you guys soon. This is Will from Going Places. Thanks for watching.